This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Hello, I'm Mark Turgensmeyer, Director of the Orfila Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And today we have a very distinguished group of people to talk about a very interesting topic, the emergence of a new academic field. Now, this is kind of a rare thing within academia for a whole new field to be developed, but the field of global studies has emerged within the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, not only here in the University of California system, but around the world. In 1995, when we first started the Global and International Studies program here at the University of California, Santa Barbara, we thought we were doing something unique. We didn't know of anybody anywhere who was doing such a thing. Uh, and when, in fact, we were one of the first uh, academic programs in global studies anywhere in the world. And now, there are academic programs in global studies at almost all major universities. There are graduate programs in global studies in the United States, in Europe, in Asia. And we found out that our thinking about trying to study this new awareness of the global connections within the world was something that many people had been doing around the world for some time. So today we're bringing together some of the people who are, have been critical in the development of this field to try to answer some very basic questions. What is global studies? Where did it come from? Why is it important? Where is it going? Uh, with me in this segment of the program, I have Roland Robertson from the UK, uh, Jan Nederveen Pieterse uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, both of whom have written extensively about and uh, in this field and are regarded as some of the major figures. And later on, we will have Manfred Steger from Australia, we'll have Cheng Gang Guo from China, Jonathan Lewis from Japan to talk about the development of the field of global studies and where it's going. So Roland, let me start with you. You're often regarded as one of the first scholars to recognize that there was something distinctive happening in the world that deserved a special area of study. I've known you for years as a sociologist and a sociologist of religion. How did you begin to write about globalization and what now we think of as global studies? Well, my first experience of this approach or what we now call global studies was taken in two steps. I was in, in this undecided as to what to study when I first went to do my undergraduate period and so I had to choose between international relations and sociology. And even though I eventually chose sociology, I, all the time I sort of hung on into international relations. Then later I went in the late 1960s to the University of Pittsburgh, which in 1966 had established a large center which is still very prominent in the field of international studies. It was called the University Center for International Studies. But you weren't writing about globalization in 1966, were you? I mean, this came later. Well, I was writing about what we would now call global mm -hmm. studies then, because I wrote a book, for example, called International Systems and the Modernization of Societies, mm -hmm. which would now be regarded as within the field of global studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, when last year, if I may flatter myself a bit, I won the uh, Best Distinguished Career Award from the ASA for the section on global and transnational sociology. Mm -hmm. It took in mind the fact that I began writing about this kind of study, this kind of approach which we now call global studies as long ago as 1965, in fact. But after the Cold War, suddenly the world begins to look different. And often this is characterized as an era of globalization. 
I don't know whether you feel that way about it because mm -hmm. you're the person who's been writing about globalization for mm -hmm. some time, but that's, that's kind of the way we think of it. And did that give a whole new infusion to the kind of work that you were doing? I think it probably did, but not necessarily in a good way because at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of communism, at least the temporary breakup of communism, because I have always believed that communism will return and it has returned, is returning in the different forms right now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, the major approach to other societies from the American point of view and indeed from the West European point of view was to emphasize the economic aspects. Mm -hmm. So there was a great opportunity, so they thought, to have what was called shock therapy, to rush into Russia, rush into mm -hmm. Poland and say, give us free markets, give us capitalism. And they thought it could start by just simply like that, but it mm -hmm. couldn't. And then people began to realize that underpinning Mark, uh, capitalism with all sorts of other cultural phenomena, political phenomena, and so on and so forth. In, in that way, global studies began to get larger. Right, because we often think of globalization as something that's economic and not, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all of these other aspects of globalization, mm -hmm. demographic shifts, huge numbers of people mm -hmm. moving around the world, cultural diffusion, new technologies that make it possible mm -hmm. for people to communicate everywhere across the globe. Uh, Jan, you've written in the field of global studies, and actually, Roland, I guess, is best known for theories of globalization and globalization. Uh, is global studies and the study of globalization the same thing? How do you conceptualize it? And how did you get started writing about this kind of topic? Those are two questions. So All right. how I started <laughs> take quickly. The, take the last one first. Yeah, and then yeah, come quickly, back to quickly. The first one. Um, <laughs> I did an early uh, book well, called um, uh, "Empire and Emancipation: mm -hmm. uh, Power and Liberation on a World Scale." And that was um, a critique of world system theory, uh, a treatment of Marxist approaches and discussions of imperialism. And I took imperialism back to the era of the, of the Crusades, etc., and comparing it also to the classical empires. And I wanted to bring in the importance of emancipation movements and social movements into the shaping and making world history at, uh, at a global scale. For instance, there's a chapter devoted to how the triangular trade, uh, including the slave trade, a um, hundred years later becomes a triangle of emancipation in which uh, um, social forces in Africa cooperate with social forces and exiles and diasporas but you in the Americas. But you could have these and, topics and at any time. Was there something about the period after the Cold War that then made this a, of a greater interest to you and to the general academic community? Oh, the Cold War is an episode mm -hmm. uh, in this particular con context. Um, I don't think it is all that sick. Well, it's significant for that particular period, but not so much generally. Second question, uh, Mark. Um, globalization studies, 40 years. Global studies, 15 years. I think the key difference is, and not everybody will agree about it, but the key difference is that globalization studies are largely anchored in the social science and humanities disciplines. And therefore, <laughs> and therefore, they are um, circumscribed, demarcated mm -hmm. by um, paradigms and theoretical leanings in the disciplines. A consequence of that is that if you look at the definitions of globalization in the different disciplines, international relations, economics, cultural studies, etc., etc., you, you see startlingly different def definitions. Mm -hmm. um, that is, if I look at it, not where Roland looks at it. <laughs> um, now, the key point then when we turn to global studies is that the global is the center of attention and comes into its own. And um, the, 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 the disciplinary orientations are, are tools, instruments, 
They don't lead the way. It's a key difference. Uh, Roland, you've been uh, almost hopping out of your seat. I, <laughs> you, well, I'm, I'm sitting. Uh, <laughs> but you don't entirely agree with this line of no, thinking. No, I, I thoroughly disagree, actually. <laughs> to take myself narcissistically as an example, <laughs> I work in the fields of international relations, political science, anthropology, cultural studies, and yes, sociology. Mm -hmm. I myself am not the only one to work in all fields. I think the big mistake that Jan is making, or Jan, sorry, is making is to think that, w that is to get trapped in the field of disciplinarity. I have noticed sometimes that But is it that where it comes from? People come out of disciplines when they're... Yeah, the but it doesn't mean to say they have to consummate disciplines. Yeah. Lots of departments now are advertising certain areas of study as post-disciplinary mm. or anti-disciplinary, that mm. kind of thing. Whereas Jan, as I understand him, thinks of global studies as interdisciplinary. And I think that interdisciplinary is a fatal route to follow because international disciplinary serves who? It serves the administrators, it serves the heads of the universities because they like the idea of managing departments. So you think global studies should be, in a sense, transdisciplinary, that is, yes. move beyond the kind of narrow confines exactly. of disciplinary. And Jan, do you disagree with that? I mean, that's not necessarily antithetical to what you're saying, right? I completely agree. Well, there we are. <laughs> I knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> but then what, what is the, wait a second, did we miss something? Then, then the difference, we, we were trying to make a distinction between globalization as a field of, the study of globalization yeah. as a field and global studies. Because some people would decide, would define global studies as the study of globalization. Well, I would. But... Is there anything wrong with that? I wouldn't do that because globalization is however you define it and you know, I think there is much more consensus in the across the fields than mm -hmm. Jan recognizes. Mm -hmm. it, globalization is a process. What kind of process? There are other aspects to the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. You know, comparison, regional studies, um, world events and so on and so forth. They have nothing in themselves to do with globalization. They can be incorporated into studies of globalization. They are not the same as globalization. And global studies includes more than simply the process of yes. globalization. Yes. It includes the study of communities, events, yeah. processes, trends mm -hmm. that have then been mm -hmm. the result maybe of globalization but now are a part of the factor yeah. of uh, features of modern life. That's right. A contemporary life is a whole issue of whether we're moved into a postmodernism in yeah. this global era is a whole other subject of conversation. So are you comfortable with the notion then that there is a coherent field of studies called global studies? Or is it simply a combination of what people are kind of interested in. I mean, there are obviously is people interested in economic issues, mm -hmm. in environmental issues, in the whole social character, of demographic change, culture, religious ideologies, technology, new media. There are all of these things that have global aspects. Is global studies anything more than a lot of different things that are happening at the same time? Is there a, is there a there there? Mark, I would say this, that the overlap the similarity between globaliz studies of globalization and global studies is the object is the same, the approach is different. Mm -hmm. And different, not, not entirely, not totally, you can't push this too far because mm -hmm. a lot of globalization studies have also been interdisciplinary and, and crossed many boundaries, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but global studies from the outside, the global, is the center field mm -hmm. and the disciplines are instruments. Studies of globalization, the disciplines are still exerting a large inf influence. So the sociology of globalization is markedly different in timing, in definition, periodization than the economics of, of globalization. Mm -hmm. Global history is again a different theme. Right, but if I could answer my own question, because as you know, we've been having these discussions here at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and when you're when you're, whenever you create an academic field, your colleagues want to know, what is it you're doing? And what is it you're doing that's different than what we could do? I mean, you could do, a, and there are global, there's global sociology, global history within those departments of history and sociology and global economics. And yet, one of the things that we've tried to argue 
is that there is a coherence about global studies. That is, you are, you are open to and interested in the intersection of various aspects of globalization or global life or life in a, in a global era uh, that may involve two or three or more of these different disciplinary approaches. Often our work is in teams or often our work is transdisciplinary, as you say, and like you, I'm in several departments. I'm in sociology, and I'm in global studies, and I'm in religious mm -hmm. studies because all of our interests in the study of globalization are beyond the kind of confines of traditional disciplines. And that's the argument that we make in saying that we should have our own academic home. We should have our own field of studies. You've probably had that argument uh, among your own colleagues. What yeah, makes well, global well studies one, different. One, one sort of manifestation of the issue which you've just addressed is the fact that many universities across the world, America and Britain, which I know the two, the two I know best, mm -hmm. Long ago, it must have happened here, must have happened in many universities, you've been in Yan too. Mm -hmm. The university itself, the top, the heads, the heads of the department, all decide rather suddenly, without really knowing what they're doing, to say, now we must globalize all our courses. Mm -hmm. I remember being at the University of Pittsburgh in the early 90s when a mm -hmm. kind of instruction came from on high. Mm -hmm. Every single course must include a global component. Every uh -huh. single course must include a comparative component. And isn't that a good thing? It's a very good thing. But they sort of left it there. So if mm. somebody added, shall we say, Sweden to the mm. study of Germany, that was considered to be global. And that's what we see nowadays in textbooks. They say, you see a sort of social stratification, semicolon, a global approach. And what mm. they mean is the last book those two people, one, two, three, wrote about social stratification was just about, shall we say, Canada and uh, USA. Mm. And now they've added on to it Mexico. So that makes it global. And this is absurd, but mm. nonetheless, this is the sort of thing that happens. So it's a kind of uh, convention, a kind of fashion, which we have to avoid if we're going to be very serious about mm. this subject. But as your earlier uh, suggestion mm. was try to define what, what we're doing, I think you can go too far with this. Mm. I don't think you can set up a kind of model, a template for global studies and say everybody must follow or implement this template. Mm -hmm. This is hoping for too much, I think. Um, some notes. One, global studies is a new synthesis. Mm -hmm. And it's a new synthesis for which there's enormous social de demand and there are many intellectual and social and political pressures that makes this Relevant, <laughs> and um, <coughs> and um, I think it's for me that call, but that's all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is it for, is it for <laughs> global studies? <laughs> yeah, it's very global. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's a it's a fundamentally important and strategic synthesis. Second point, it is a field. Uh, intellectually, theoretically, that is in the making. It is a project in the making um, and that is partly unfulfilled, which is fine. Third point, it has the potential. If philosophy was the queen of the sciences, 18th, 19th century, mm. economics was the dominant discipline Still in is. the 20th cen century, it was, 20th century, mm. 21st century, global studies has the potential to be a leading field. Mm. So these are considerations and things, all the parts are moving, many things are in flux, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And a template, we will need both to make one and transcend one. Mm -hmm. And the example of economics is interesting because within sociology or political science, within other departments, they study economics, obviously, mm -hmm. and they discuss, discuss economic issues. And yet one couldn't imagine any university uh, existing without a department of economics because you have to have at least one location where you can focus on what is special about that area and how uh, the various aspects of it are integrated. And you're making the same argument about global studies, that at some point in the future, and presumably we're not there yet, but at some point in the future, global studies may be seen as that kind of 
synthetic field that provides a window into something very fundamental about uh, contemporary life that integrates well, a lot of different aspects. Couple, well, I'd add a couple of things, maybe the, a bit different from Jan's emphasis, but mm. we must always remember that universities in their making through the 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st centuries have involved a process of differentiation, splitting up the whole academic life into disciplines. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a reverse mode. And one aspect of that reversal, or going back to a kind of po more polymathic, po more polymath kind of approach, mm -hmm. is, there is, is the manifest, one of the manifestations of that disciplinary mutation is in fact global studies. Mm -hmm. But if we were, for example, to be some university in Italy or France three or 400 years ago, what would we be studying? I do. I think it would look rather more, a little bit more like global studies is now mm. than global study than than what was to be seen in university, shall we say, in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. And one three hundred years ago, we would have been studying theology. Uh, uh, among, uh, yeah, that would and be regarded. People like Adam Smith, who were regarded as an economist, was a moral theologian. Of he would have been regarded as. And as Marx, mm. I think, rightly said, mm -hmm. theology is the is the, is the table of contents of all theoretical struggles. That's mm. the one thing I always have subscribed to about Marx. I may mm. have given up much of my Marxism, <laughs> but that's the one thing I haven't given. <laughs> but one more word about economics. The irony of economics as a discipline, it's very different from other disciplines in this respect. Mm. The worse the economy is doing, the mm. more demand there is for economists. Mm -hmm. I've noticed, for example, to take another aspect of this, if an economics department is doing very badly in the rankings of universities, what happens? They don't destroy the department. No, no, they pour more money into <laughs> economics department. And the worse they do, they get more money. Mm -hmm. And they also earn money on the side in any case. <laughs> but this now we're in another phase. Right? So what do we do? We look more and more television programs, more newspapers. The Wall Street Journal sells more and more copies and so on and so forth because we all feed feel unwisely that we need more economists. Mm -hmm. We don't. Mm -hmm. Economy, if, if you can talk about disciplines letting us down, the one that's let us down the most in the history of disciplines is surely economics. Mm -hmm. Well, our colleagues might say that, you know, this is also true of the university, we don't need more fields of study. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, people within academia look at fields like oh, feminist studies or ethnic studies, uh, these are new fields that have developed in recent years and so why do we need such a thing? You mm -hmm. can cover that in existing departments mm -hmm. of sociology or anthropology or political science or whatever. And I think there are probably people who are saying the same thing about global studies. In the late 90s when we decided to start a global studies program here at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, we didn't know of any existing anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So we had no idea how many students we were attracting. We thought, oh, maybe 20 or so. And mm -hmm. remember, we designed like a capstone seminar for that small number of majors that we thought we would attract in our undergraduate program in global studies. Within a year, we had several hundred. And in two or three years, we had 900 majors. We're now one of the largest majors within the university. With a small number of faculty, of course we borrowed courses from other departments, we used our small number of faculty we had to teach core courses on these, this syncretic and synthetic uh, overview that you're talking about to try to look at the world as a whole. And we discovered that's what students wanted. Mm -hmm. That's what they came to the university to, to understand, not just about particular things, but how all of this fit together in a contemporary world that made a difference to them. And I realized that w we've been forcing students to do this on their own. You know, they have to take all these different courses in different departments, and then we expect them to go back to their dorm room and sit and somehow synthesize all this different disparate materials. But isn't, isn't it useful to have at least one program that tries to well, put some of the major features together? I think that a little bit of this, not mm -hmm. I don't want to exaggerate, a little bit of this may have something to do with a particular s potential student constituency of California as a state. Mm -hmm. You know, all sorts of different, particularly from, uh, from Asia, mm -hmm. meaning particularly East Asia, and all sorts of mm -hmm. Latin American so on. 
in, in California is rather unique in the sense of it being a track, able to attract many people from different different parts of the world. Now, when I went to the University of Pittsburgh in oh, 1967 or 8, 67, I think, uh, it did, as I've just said, or had said a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. a large, dip, um, in, a large uh, uh, institute of international education. Now, I always argue when I was there that international was the wrong word, that it put off people from taking because they thought it was mm. just about international relations, which it wasn't. Relations between nation states. Yeah, exactly, mm. because it had regional mm. studies of all kinds. Part of those regional studies were, in fact, bound up with the Cold War. So, for example, if you wanted to study Greece there, you had to study on the heading of West European studies, because mm. West European studies was part of of the West of the Cold War sense, in the mm. Cold War sense. So, mm. in that sense, you should be very, very proud of yourselves here. But I would say, in no defense of Pittsburgh, but nonetheless, it did have this huge and innovative sure. School of International Studies, but mm. it used the wrong name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Global Studies here is a response to one, American provincialism. <laughs> Second, California provincialism. <laughs> and third, the two faces of American hegemony. Through American hegemony, Americans claim world knowledge yeah. and at the same time are aware of the vacuousness of that knowledge. It's a pretend knowledge. It's a <laughs> claim to know the world while not actually being in the world because there are these uh, two oceans. Well, I entirely, may I interrupt there, I entirely disagree, very <laughs> thoroughly disagree with that. And we lie on you <laughs> but, disagree. But the fact, the, the thought that you think that the, the average American has a great world knowledge and is a proud of it is ridiculous <laughs> because there is so much opposition <laughs> to putting other cultures and other historical periods in the curriculum. There's so much opposition, like if, for example, there are many there's a book that I read a long time ago. There are many books like that. The, along with the anti-scientific movement, there's an anti-global movement in this country, which is very powerful. Would Sarah Palin, for example, would the Tea Party want other people to learn about Japan, China, Thailand? Mm. No, they would want. They want to get it out of the curriculum. I know that in, in Florida in particular, in Dade County, in the 1980s, there was a great so much opposition that school, that, that, that parents sit at school banging on the door saying get these things out we do not want our kids to learn French Latin German we do not want our kids to learn about any other country but the best country in the world and they must be taught that America is the best yeah. country well, so in that sense it is provincial but you think they have yeah. global knowledge no yeah. no no but Abedron, this reminds me of an ancient Chinese saying <laughs> if you cannot find the country don't bomb it <laughs> um, I think no. it's a recent American saying yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, no, um, <laughs> no, back back to global studies and the relationship <laughs> with the disciplines. The disciplines are the gatekeepers. The disciplines are also fields of study. And the main difference is, well, they are the old timers. Mm -hmm. They are the incumbents. Mm -hmm. They are older. Mm -hmm. And they act as gatekeepers mm -hmm. in relation to the uh, new field, feminist studies, mm -hmm. uh, urban mm -hmm. studies, etc., etc. And global studies mm -hmm. is another one. And if you look at supermarkets, mm -hmm. uh, in the new aisles they have ethnic foods, Asian mm -hmm. foods, they are add-on aisles, and in the same way the studies uh, <laughs> occupy this, um, this so new position. So we become the global yeah. supermarket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you've raised you know, a very interesting point about you know, the perspective on, on the world, whether there's something paro can be something parochial about global studies. Of course they Whose can. view of the globe are you talking about? And is, this an, um, is American global studies different from global studies in other parts of the world? And this is actually a nice segue because this conversation has been really terrific in talking about the origins and conceptualization of the field. Uh, but when we come back in our next section, we're going to be talking with people who have developed global studies in Australia and Japan and China, and we're going to talk about the way in which global studies look differently from different parts of the world, or maybe, surprisingly, quite similar. 
But thank you so much for an engaging conversation. You guys are terrific to talk with, and I'm looking forward to the continuation of our discussion. Cheers. Thank you. Ray. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm Mark Jorgensmeyer, the director of the Orfila Center for Global and Inter International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And we're continuing our discussion of the development of this interesting new field of global studies. We've been talking about the origins of the field, it's how it's developed, and the basic concepts of how one thinks about globalization and global studies. And now we're joined by three important people in the field. The people who have developed uh, global studies, not just in Europe and the United States, but in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, Manfred Steger is with us, who helped uh, create and develop the field of global studies at uh, RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, and now holds a joint position with the University of Hawaii. Manfred's also author of what could be, I guess, one of the most uh, popular books in globalization that's sold anywhere. Um, uh, uses textbooks and hundreds of courses. Chang Gung Guo, uh, Dean of Graduate Studies at Shanghai University, who is helping to create the first uh, global studies program in China. Uh, Jonathan Lewis from Hirotsubashi University in Japan, uh, who uh, was an instrumental in helping to create uh, one of the first global graduate studies programs anywhere. And Jonathan, I want to start with you mm -hmm. because when we started our uh, Global Studies graduate program here at the University of California, Santa Barbara, we thought, oh boy, we're the first because we knew we were the first in the creating an undergraduate program. And then we found out, darn, <laughs> if Japan hadn't beat us to it. And that was you at, at Hitotsubashi University. How did that come about and what were you thinking? Well, I wasn't actually there when it, when it was started. This was about 15 years ago, 96, 97. So you can't take personal credit no, for it? No, I arrived there a few years after it had been started. And uh, uh, our Graduate School of Social Sciences uh, established the Institute for the Study of Global Issues, uh, which had sort of three main uh, aims. Um, it wanted to be more issue uh, focused mm -hmm. and uh, solution oriented and also more de Eurocentric to, to try and get away from the assumption that uh, the West was the, the, way, the way of the future for other countries around the world. Uh, so we've uh, yeah. been talking about how global studies can be very parochial. That mm -hmm. is, it can be, you know, American view of global, of the globe, or sure. European view of the globe. But in your case, in Japan, you were very consciously thinking of global studies as a field that wasn't mm -hmm. European or American in conceptualization. Definitely. And of course it had a lot to do with the, the, the situation of Japan in the uh, 90s, where you know, Japan had become the world's second largest economy, um, but it was really searching for a sort of new role in geopolitics. So like with the Gulf War, Japan had given a lot of financial support, but had been criticized for you know, just giving money and not, not uh, contributing militarily. And so then you had uh, Japan contributing more to peacekeeping organizations. You had the Japanese uh, Sadako Ogata became the head of the UNHCR for the 90s. And uh, you had a lot of uh, searching for a new role in, in the world uh, economy and, and, and politics. Yes, because it's yeah. not just your university, but uh, also mm -hmm. Sophia University in Tokyo right. and Doshoshi University. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other global That's studies right. programs. Yes. And there are a lot of scholars in Japan. The Asian Global Studies Association, this new organization, is really based in Japan. True. So interestingly, uh, Japan is a real center for global studies in Asia. Yes. And I was just wondering and why I, that's the case. Well, I think it, you know, it grew up partly for these sort of national reasons. And then I think also there was an expansion of graduate education in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, so student, un until the 90s, most university masters and PhD courses were really, their aim was to, to, their purpose was to reproduce the next generation of university professors uh, who would be in their, in their disciplines. Um, but then um, in, from the 90s, there was a more demand for um, particularly master's courses mm -hmm. from students who didn't want to become a professor, they just wanted to learn more and understand the world better and then go and get a job in, in all kinds of different companies or organizations. And that kind of freed them from having to study in a narrow discipline, uh, disciplinary uh, sort of style. And uh, so they were able to focus on, on different issues and uh, that was a real source of demand mm -hmm. for, for global issues and 
Um, now, Manfred, you know, in, in Australia, you you were creating a, in Melbourne not just a program in global studies, but a whole school of global studies. Mm -hmm. What what was behind that? Was that simply an administrative term because it sounded kind of jazzy to put together programs that had nothing to do with globalization, or was there something more substantive to it? Than no, that? actually, I think it's much more substantive mm -hmm. in the sense that it really grew out of a, a globalization center, a research center that was already up and running for about three years. For what, what time, when are we talking about? What time uh, This was about uh, 2005 is when I came. That's mm -hmm. about seven years ago. But this mm -hmm. center really started in 2002 mm -hmm. and was started by uh, two uh, relatively well-known scholars who were mm -hmm. really uh, looking at nationalism mm -hmm. and how the nation state was changing, mm -hmm. which is a very important, as you know, core uh, hmm. dynamic that hmm. a lot of globalization, global studies uh, uh, right. experts are looking at. Well, that's at. interesting because you think of global <coughs> studies as being transnational, mm -hmm. and here you're saying that the, 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 the Center for Globalization at Melbourne started looking at the changing nature of the nation state within exactly. a global framework, for example. Exactly, yeah. and, and they understood that something was happening, that the nation state system as we know it was destabilizing, mm -hmm. and globalization was in the air. People were talking about globalization. Mm -hmm. So the question then became, what can be done to turn this small research center into something that was bigger and was looking at globalization dynamics that were happening both across nation states, but also within nation states. Yeah, but it's one thing to have a research center, and actually there are scores of research centers in global studies mm -hmm. and globalization around the, around the world. People recognize it's an important thing to study mm -hmm. as a research field, but how do you translate that into a teaching program, and why would necessarily a particular thing you want to study be thought of as something that people could then make as their academic career or their academic focus. Well, in a way, when I came, I came in as head of school of uh, a school of international and community studies. Mm -hmm. So this idea of international studies was already around, mm -hmm. and there was only a second social science school, a school of social science and uh, urban planning. Mm -hmm. And my idea mm -hmm. was to simply merge these two schools. Uh, we were within a school of technology where social sciences, in a way, a little underprivileged anyway, and by combining our forces under the umbrella of global studies, what we were able to do is avoid the traps of disciplinary specializations and sometimes, you know, these disciplinary walls that go up, but really opening it up under the umbrella of global studies, globalization, and study those dynamics and global issues, I suppose, a little bit like in Japan, uh, in a sense uh, of centering uh, our attention and our research efforts really to issues and questions and projects rather than disciplines. And I think that was what uh, most of us really agreed on, that most of the dynamics we were interested in were, in a way, globalizing dynamics or and transnational And you found dynamics. that you had students for that. I mean, it, yes. was, it wasn't like, in, in our case at UC Santa Barbara, I was saying that, you know, we, we started thinking, what, what students would be interested in this subject yes. that never existed before, and suddenly we discovered lots. Yeah, you know, the same. 900 undergraduate majors. Now we have 40 people in our graduate program. We're starting a, an interdisciplinary PhD emphasis and now a PhD program. The yes. student interest has just been fantastic. Did you find the same uh, thing? Exactly the same mm -hmm. thing. And we, we really started from a very small cohort of about 35 students mm -hmm. and very quickly grew to about 120 students. You're talking about graduate students now, not uh, just uh, undergraduates. In, no, this were just mm -hmm. undergrads. And then we had in addition to that. I see. You're, uh, now you're talking you started with the undergraduate program with exactly. a small number and it grew. Right, it grew up to mm -hmm. about 120. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, we also developed a master's mm -hmm. program which attracted a lot of people. Now, Chiang Gang, you're in a very interesting position. You are a brave man <laughs> <laughs> because here's this emerging field that's beginning to take hold in different parts of the world, uh, but you boldly uh, stake, a stake to claim uh, in China and created the first Global Studies program at the at Shanghai University, the first Global Studies program in China. Yeah. I know that you know there are scholars at Fudong and, and other universities, Beijing, who are interested in Global Studies and Globalization, but you've actually created the first program in Global Studies. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about and and, um, and uh, what's what's been the reaction in China? Do oh. you, you think it's going to be a growing uh, field or are people looking at you and say, what is Chang Gang doing and why is he doing this strange thing? Uh, actually, I'm very confident uh, <laughs> the Global Study Program will uh, will be uh, uh, will get more popular in China. Mm -hmm. Actually, 
uh, mainly scholars in China study, uh, uh, do global studies mainly actually from the field of international politics. Mm -hmm. But not economics. No, but, you know, mainly mm -hmm. uh, you international think of, politics. you think of China and globalization, you yeah. think of economic globalization. It, yeah, the yes, I more. think globalization is not only international politics, mm -hmm. economically, mm -hmm. cu uh, culturally. Mm -hmm. So, so many important things. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't do it just, uh, say, in a specific field or discipline, international politics or economics. Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, to uh, do uh, global studies. I think it's better to uh, do uh, like uh, uh, independent discipline, like economics, mm -hmm. like, uh, like international politics. Mm -hmm. Or global studies should be an independent mm -hmm. discipline, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you just, as all of us uh, who have been involved in the field of global studies have had to respond to questions from our colleagues saying, what is that? What is global studies? And yeah. Isn't it something that we already do in some other department? Why is it Yeah, they, they, that's the most important mm -hmm. thing is people are uh, keeping asking, but, uh, includes our university officials always ask, what are you doing? Global <laughs> studies, what do you study? <laughs> right. uh, as the, actually, this remind me that uh, global studies should not uh, to be uh, something nebulous, casual, global issue studies. Mm -hmm. Global issues, so many glo global issues. Mm -hmm. So we must find some key field mm -hmm. or sub-disciplines, uh, sub something like that, mm -hmm. as a main field of global stu uh, studies. In some ways, it's not exactly different from what you said, Manfred, but he's saying rather than studying a whole bunch of issues, you need to focus on particular critical areas. And does that, you didn't exactly say that. You could pick up from what you said that <laughs> what you do at Melbourne is to just sort of whatever people walking on the street with as some interesting issue, you, you know, that's included with global studies. But did you mean to mean it quite that broadly? Or? No, I think I agree with John Gang in that I think globalization has to be at the heart mm -hmm. of what global studies is. And by globalization, what I really mean is a process or a set of processes that has many dimensions. Well, no, wait a second. You, you literally wrote the book on globalization. Right. I said your book on globalization is probably <laughs> the most popular book in the world right now. Translated in many languages. It's, I don't know, any hundreds of thousands of copies. It's sold by Oxford. But how do you define globalization? Uh, globalization, I think that the shortest way of thinking about globalization is to think of it in terms of the intensification mm -hmm. of social relations or connections mm -hmm. across world time and world space. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is a dynamic that really fundamentally shakes up. So it's not something up. different, it's simply a more... It's not something different, it's something that has been going on, but you can think of it in terms of a car, right? Mm -hmm. When you drive a car, at least uh, you know the cars that I drove when I was young, they all had shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened is that you kick into higher gear the faster you go. So if you think of globalization as a car that kicks into gear the higher and the faster and the more intense it becomes, mm -hmm. then there are these various thresholds that are being, being crossed. And I think that one of those thresholds happened somewhere in the 1960s, 1970s, when all of a sudden, or maybe in early 1980s, when people started talking about globalization, it was as though people and people's consciousness were looking for a term, were looking for something that would express what they were all feeling, namely that somehow these, these interdependencies, these interconnections had kicked into higher gear. But, but, it does, but is that simply a quantitative difference? Is it also a qualitative difference? I mean, you can say, if you study automobiles, you don't study high speed as a separate field of studies than, you know, just automobiles driving. Uh, but it seems to me you're suggesting there's not just, this intensification does create a qualitative difference. Absolutely. Different, I think it's both. Explain it's that. Both. Uh, think of a chemist, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a chemist and if very often you, know, you add a uh, quantity mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't know, some powder into mm -hmm. water, all of a sudden you get a change of color. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing 
is both a quantitative change in terms of something that you can actually measure, mm -hmm. something that you can empirically put your fingers and your hands on and say, hey, we all of a sudden have much higher trade volumes than we've ever had before, mm -hmm. as an example. And yet at the same time, it can't be confined to quantity because uh, as quantity changes, so does quality. So all of a sudden, it's not just that we have more trade, but the kind of trade, the way we go about exchanging goods, the way we go about producing goods, mm -hmm. all of that becomes different from the way it was before. So you're, you're, you're saying two things. One is that there is something, there is a there there. There's there something is absolutely a there there. different about the yes. current era of globalization we're studying, but you're also saying that globalization has a history. Yes. There, you can look at the history of global. In Melbourne, do you have uh, historians? Of yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the core members of the team, uh, Professor Joseph Syracuse, is a diplomatic historian hmm. uh, who is particularly interested in, in questions of world history, global history. Hmm. And what he's studying hmm. uh, as, a, as a Cold War scholar is the kind of dismantlement of the Cold War system hmm. and the kind of move into a new era of diplomacy and to some extent also uh, warfare and related uh, security hmm. and conflict issues hmm. that have really, really changed in the last 20 to 30 years. You no, know, that's true here at Santa Barbara. When, mm -hmm. uh, we, one of our founding members it was a political scientist, a sociologist, a professor of English and professor of mm -hmm. history that helped start our, uh, those four people helped start the Global Studies mm -hmm. program in, in the beginning and our first separate appointment was in global history, right. then global economics. <laughs> right. You know, we regard it as that important. But that, is that true in, in, in Japan also? Is history, is global studies considered to be a field for historians or mostly uh, contemporary sociologists mm -hmm. or? To, to the best of my economics. knowledge, there's a, there's a very strong contemporary focus to mm -hmm. global studies mm -hmm. in Japan mm -hmm. and I don't, really know the reasons for that, mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's, I've, I've yet to meet a, a global historian in, mm -hmm. in, in a global studies in program Japan. in Japan. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I know there are some, I mm. attended the Asian Global Studies Association mm -hmm. meetings and I know there are some, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe not a part of the academic program. Yeah. Well, what about in China? Do you, do you think this is a, you think uh, there's a place for historians? I know that actually in our yeah, sure. first Global Studies Consortium meetings, we were trying to bring together people who were interested in graduate programs of Global Studies from Fredon University mm -hmm. in, in Shanghai. They, they were both historians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, globalization is scholars mainly from international politics or uh, international studies mm -hmm. or uh, foreign language studies, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, uh, but also some historians, especially historians from the world history, mm -hmm. actually so, uh, initiates global history. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we, bore, uh, uh, we borrow this concept from mm -hmm. United States, I think, uh -huh. global history. The first global history program uh, is in Beijing Normal University, or Beijing, uh, Capital Teachers University. Mm -hmm. Then uh, another global history program I, th I don't think it's a program, it's Fudan University mm -hmm. as, uh, in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for global history, just these two universities. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. just beginning. So you know, a lot of uh, historians now are concerned about global studies. You know what our required course for our global studies major, our inter global one, uh, mm -hmm. is, is global history and, mm -hmm. and history and culture. Uh, and that we, we look at uh, periods, moments in world history where there was this interaction across mm -hmm regions and cultures, like the ancient Mediterranean world. Mm -hmm. What a remarkable period of transnationality that was. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, ancient Mediterranean world wasn't the whole world. Mm -hmm. Well, look at the old maps. It was from their point of view. <laughs> that's, that's what they thought the world was. Mm -hmm. And the same is, is true of, uh, you know, uh, of China and the, and, the, and the moments of reaching out beyond regional associations to a larger empires and larger associations were really early moments of globalization. It's certainly colonialism and, and uh, uh, the Mongol dynasty. You can think of these different moments when there was great sweeps of activity across regional borders, all of which is a background for, and this is where we come to the other part of what you're talking about, the contemporary yes. moment of globalization, which is where you say it's not just a matter of speed, mm -hmm. not just a matter of intensification, which is the part of the definition of mm -hmm. globalization, but something 
different than happens. And mm -hmm. now I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. What is that? What think, is that different? What, what's the other happier definition? Yes, of I think to some extent, what we're really uh, looking at, and Professor Robertson is one of the people who's talked about it quite a bit, and I totally agree with him, is a change of consciousness. And what I mean by that is that globalization is not just something that happens out there, but it's something that happens, happens in here. In other words, people's understanding of who they are, what their communities are, what, where their loyalties lie, where they belong, the deepest, deepest feelings that people have in social terms hmm. are changing in a sense that not that people are losing their uh, you know, affinities for the nation state or their connection to their community mm. uh, on a local level, but they're adding new affinities. They're adding new uh, connections in a sense that their identity, their consciousness is no longer confined to particular places, but they are beginning to, if you allow me this term, multitask mm. in terms of their belongings and so in terms of their loyalties. So we're becoming global Persons we becoming global persons, and this mm -hmm. happens gradually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you can already see that, for example, the number of dual citizenships mm -hmm. is is going up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a scholar in Germany uh, by the name of Ulrich Beck who coined, I think, a wonderful term mm -hmm. uh, for this. He called it uh, place polygamy. Hmm. And what he means is that we are married not just to one place, but increasingly we are married to many different places. So you might, for example, in, 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 in my case, you might be teaching uh, in Australia for half a year, and then you teach at the University of Hawaii for another half year. In between, you might go and give, go to conferences and give lectures. And this is not just in and the you're academic originally, profession. You're originally from Aus Austria, That's right? correct. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my, my question then becomes, uh, you know, where are you really your loyalties? And, and my answer to that is, you know, to many different places. I don't mm. see myself exclusively mm. being or belonging to one nation state or to one community. But exactly. you think it's not just because of global connections and awareness, but a global consciousness. That's right. Mm. So talking about consciousness or identification, that's remind me that globalization, just, uh, just as Mark uh, was think, uh, uh, talk about, I, th I think should be uh, something different from different uh, places. Say, scholars from the United States maybe uh, think global studies should like this. Uh, scholars from Japan or Europe should think global st studies should like that. But scholars from China maybe think differently. Well, so I think global studies maybe not uh, really very globally, uh -huh. maybe have some uh, special distinction. Yeah, we can say yeah. Japan and China are among the most nationalist countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is global studies a part of a global consciousness in some place like China or Japan? Well, I mean, for example, to go back to the history point, um, all Japanese high school students do global uh, world history, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, history is divided into Japanese history and world history. So maybe compared to America or some European countries, mm -hmm. um, the, I, there's already a, a kind of, it's taken for granted that you're going to be looking at world history or global history. So, that, um, so maybe that's not necessary. There's not such a need for a new view of, of history from a global perspective But at, it in does change right? attitudes. I mean, the sure. very fact that you're becoming more aware of what's going on mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. was at a conference recently on, on global studies. There was a professor from Riyadh, from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about our global studies program you know, here at, at Santa Barbara. And he says, that's what we needed. Saudi Arabia. My <laughs> colleagues should only think about the Middle East. They need to think about the world. Right on, brother. <laughs> but is that also true in China? Do you think? Actually, it depends. I think maybe some scholars think we should think more globally, uh, especially when China now involves more and more in global issues, global world. But in other, uh, some other scholars may be uh, more concerned about the ident uh, identification or national concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I, China's I, I, global leadership, yeah, yeah. for example. You know, That's uh, what I think most important for global studies. I think globalization mm -hmm. actually propose big or great challenge mm -hmm. to diff different societies, mm -hmm. different cultures. Mm -hmm. So global studies must concentrate on the challenge mm -hmm. globalization. Uh, 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 
put out. I mm. think you, mu you must think about mm -hmm. or take serious, uh, mm -hmm. seriously about the challenge mm -hmm. of globalization mm -hmm. to different societies. For China, I think we, uh, we China uh, Chinese people I think we are not have a very privileged position in the global systems or global world. I think. But now so, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, uh, uh, but historically, we all mm. think this. Mm. Uh, I usually uh, mm. to give an example to my students. Say, if a lion or a tiger live together with rabbits in a jungle, what do you think? The way of mood or the system, different animals will adopt. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the lion or tiger must agree to take a liberal policy okay. to be liberal. But the rabbits must think we should organize. We should have something <laughs> a god. Are to there any, no rabbits left? <laughs> Actually, the world the same. Maybe United States Americans think we should adopt liberal policies. Everything we should open. Right. But some small nations, yeah. weak societies. Uh, Maybe think different. Uh, so global, global studies may mean different things within different contexts, but is the study the same regardless of where you go? I mean, are we all, uh, are we all in some ways studying the, the change, not only the intensification and the, and the frequency of interaction, but to some extent the global consciousness that you're talking about, even though we ourselves may not become <laughs> globalized in the process, but at least the awareness that this is occurring, is that a part of what we study in global studies? Absolutely. Uh, yes. For example, in Australia, we are very interested in the question of uh, political ideologies, mm -hmm. uh, political belief systems. I mean, you yourself have written extensively mm -hmm. on religious belief systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that is a wonderful example of how consciousness is really changing when you look at religions mm -hmm. uh, and, and your books in that area really clearly show that there is a shift in terms of new religions coming up, there's a new ways of mixing mm -hmm. uh, that is part of the globalization process. The same is true in the political world. Mm -hmm. When you look at socialism, liberalism, conservatism, the old ideologies are no longer the way they were. We are now beginning to look at what I call globalisms mm -hmm. or ideologies of real global reach mm -hmm. uh, that are much more eclectic, that are much more mixed, and mm -hmm. I think that's part of what we're studying in terms of the change in consciousness as an example. So do you think we're studying the future? I mean, uh, 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 of course the field is new, but we all think that the field, we hope, we expect it to grow, B but is that because we expect the world to be changing? Are we uh, inevitably on a course of globalization and global consciousness, consciousness in this world? Are, are, are we just in a phase of interaction and then we'll all retreat back to our own little narrow identities and domains. I think, uh, I think, I think there are global changes, but in, um, for example, with technology and, internet mm -hmm. and, and uh, the internet, mm -hmm. uh, in China or, or Korea or Japan or all over the world, uh, social media, for example, mm -hmm. uh, spread, they're being adopted very rapidly, but if um, people are mostly using them in their own language. Mm -hmm. so. Communication is really divided. I mean, there are many internets, mm -hmm. in, in most, and very few people are communicating a, in m more than one language. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, uh, although you have common technologies and, and common practices, at the same time, people are probably communicating as much as ever within a certain sort of cultural boundary. I mean, this has been such an interesting discussion. I want to thank you, and I want to you know thank everybody who's watching for staying with us to discuss what really has been an enormously interesting new development within academic uh, within a, a academic world, but also it has a relevance to the world w in which we're living, because what we've been talking about just now I is not only how global studies provides an integration of different fields of knowledge, but uh, the way in which it really is, 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 is tracing and, and studying and examining and exploring this extraordinary phenomenon that occurs uh, throughout the world. In, in the graduate consortium of global studies of which we're all a part and active members, we've defined global studies not only as, uh, as interdisciplinary and as studying transnational things, uh, as being not just from one point of view, but global studies has to be global, uh, in, in its approach, but we've also uh, are aware that we are helping to train global citizens. That we are we are embarked in a teaching program, not just a research program, 
with the consciousness that we're producing, not just new scholars, but new citizens of the globe. Thank you so much for taking part in what has been really a very rich and interesting discussion. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.